All right, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. We'll get started in just a few seconds here. We're just gonna let, um, let everyone jump on and then we'll, we'll begin. All right, then, why don't we get started? So, um, good, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of those who are joining us. Uh, my name is Courtney Dogger, and I am the president of Network 2020. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Network 2020, we are a uh, New York-based organization that it really is a platform for um, innovative and solutions-driven foreign affairs education and impact. So we run a lot of briefings like these, um, now all online and, and virtual that we broadcast to the world over. Uh, but we often do a lot of these events in person in New York, um, amid, in, in addition to some other projects as well. So please do check out our website, follow us on Twitter, um, and, um, and I hope that we see all of you at future events. So today, um, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Joseph Nye. Uh, so for those of you who might not be familiar, and I'm assuming everyone is, um, he really is a, a heavyweight in the foreign policy world. Um, I'm not going to read his bio, but just you know, say a few words. It's up on the screen for those of you who are joining by computer. Um, but his, his many books are regularly cited by top political scholars and presidential candidates um, as must read. So he really is helping shape the thinking of um, those who are leaders in the world. Um, uh, he quite literally wrote the book on soft power and really is a, a voice of reason and pragmatism and big picture thinking um, when I think so many of us can kind of get caught in a, uh, in a tunnel of fear-based thinking. And so it's really quite refreshing to, to listen to him speak. Um, so the way today will work is I'll start off in conversation with Dr. Nye for a few questions and then We'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, and if at any point you do have a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. So with that, Dr. Nye, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna start off by talking about your new book, which is Do Morals Matter? Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump. And um, as the title implies, you evaluate the foreign policies of a succession of US presidents based on the morality of those decisions. So could you first um, define morality in this context and then also elaborate on what role it has played in foreign policy throughout history? Well, morality is uh, the ought statements, what we should do, uh, as opposed to the is statements, what is. And uh, generally speaking, there's been a strong tradition in uh, the study of international relations and foreign policy to say that morality doesn't matter, that it's all national interest that matters. And uh, as the saying goes, uh, uh, interests bake the cake and then politicians come along and sprinkle a little morality on it or moral reasoning on it, kind of like icing to make it look pretty, but still it's all national interests that bake the cake. And um, I had a feeling uh, that this was inadequate that this type of reasoning was inadequate. And so the uh, uh, purpose of the book, the writing of the book, was to, to show by looking at each of the 14 presidents that we've had since 1945, that if you had this cynical view of history, uh, you were gonna get history wrong, that there were a number of cases where it actually made a great difference what a president's moral views were, what he thought ought to happen rather than just what is happening. And uh, so the purpose of the book was to, first of all, demonstrate uh, that historically morals and moral reasoning by presidents have made a big difference uh, to historical outcomes of great importance. And secondly, uh, to say, well, right, if it's true that they're important, how should we think about them? So that's the purpose of the book. Okay, just unmuting myself quickly. Thank you, great. So could you talk then a little bit about um, how you set about evaluating the morality of a president's foreign policy and, and maybe you could give us an example of what that looks like? Well, I think one of the problems is that uh, very often people take a quick shortcut in terms of judging morality. Uh, if we have good intentions, 
if we mean well, therefore we must be moral. And since Americans uh, always believe that we're a moral people, we haven't always been a moral people, but we believe it, um, there's, this is called American exceptionalism. So that if a president says the right things and, and has good intentions, we say, well, then that's a moral foreign policy. He has moral clarity. For example, um, uh, Ari Fleischer, who was uh, George W. Bush's uh, press secretary, said you had to admire uh, Bush's uh, moral clarity because he had a freedom agenda for Iraq. Um, and it struck me that that's very shallow reasoning, that uh, after all, there is a well-known proverb that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And just to have good intentions um, going into Iraq didn't make it a moral action. I, I, I sometimes use this analogy of, uh, of uh, it, uh, it, a, a road accident. Imagine that a friend of yours says that, um, you'll pick up your daughter and bring her home from the high school dance early so that she gets a good night's rest before her exams tomorrow morning or SATs or something. And um, so he picks her up, um, uh, doesn't notice that the road has become wet and slippery, um, uses excessive speeds, let's say 70 miles an hour, skids off the road, and your daughter hits a tree and your daughter is killed. Uh, his intentions remain good but you certainly wouldn't call that a moral action. You'd say that basically there was um, uh, inattention or not ad inadequate due diligence to the means and he chose uh, bad means for his purposes. And second, that there was inadequate attention to the prospect of unintended consequences, which could be highly immoral. In law, we call that a failure of doing due diligence or culpable negligence. So that's an example from sort of a homely example of how we really want to think of judging moral actions in three dimensions, not just intentions. We want to look at the intentions, the means, and the consequences. And I can apply that then to, to uh, Ari Fleischer's defense of Bush and to the invasion of Iraq. Let's grant Bush good intentions that he wanted to bring freedom to uh, Iraq or democracy or uh, whatever. Uh, but he ignored the means uh, that the State Department and the intelligence community had prepared a lot of papers warning him about the problems that he didn't have adequate means to accomplish these goals. And they were tossed aside, so to speak. And uh, the uh, consequences were highly immoral. I mean, the net effect of the invasion was to remove Saddam Hussein. That was good. But it also strengthened Al Qaeda in Iraq, which uh, morphed into uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, which had horrendous immoral consequences for Iraqis and for the region as a whole. So, uh, I would argue that the action, the invasion of Iraq, uh, was an immoral foreign policy, even if you grant uh, good intentions for going in. Okay, th th thank you for, for, for those examples. Um, it seems like some people might be having a hard time hearing, and so I apologize. Uh, can, can people hear me while I speak? I know that some people have been posting in the chat. Um, okay, so some people say it's better with earphones. Okay, and and we'll just make sure we're close to the speakers because I, I can hear you fine, Dr. Nye, but I think some people might not be able to. Um, just to, um, yeah, so, so if you wouldn't mind just speaking maybe a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you if you can um, no just one, one follow-up question on that is there um, you know how would you or, or are there any current or not not current US presidents <laughs> there's only one current US president are there any presidents in US history that, that you think have done a particularly good job um, at uh, these intentions and the means and the consequences well interestingly uh, one of the best examples one of the presidents who comes out, highest in my book, I give them all little scorecards and explain why, um, is 
uh, the father of the president I just criticized, which is Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, which shows, I guess, that these problems are not genetic. But um, the uh, George H.W. Bush um, uh, was extremely thoughtful and uh, managed to keep his own ego separated from the actions he's taking. So when the uh, Berlin Wall came down, uh, he was criticized by some for not making a bigger uh, celebration of it. And his comment was, I'm not going to dance on the wall. I have to negotiate with Gorbachev. In other words, if I embarrass him, I'm not going to be able to negotiate. Well, the negotiations that Bush carried out were really quite extraordinary in their success. You saw the end of a Cold War, a 40-year uh, contest without a shot being fired and uh, with Germany uh, reunited inside NATO. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, and it had a lot to do with the father of George H.W. Bush's contextual intelligence. He really understood the situation in a way that his son didn't. Uh, he did his uh, due diligence, so to speak. And he also had emotional intelligence, the ability to make sure that even if you had good intentions, that they weren't corrupted by emotional needs and motives that got in the way. Uh, so in that sense, um, many people think of uh, George H.W. Bush as not flashy. Well, he may not have been flashy, but he produced a very good and moral foreign policy. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting in that it seems like there's, um, in, in just having watched some of your videos and, you know, familiar with your work, that there's a real element of, of psychology that, that comes into play. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, just uh, switching a little bit. So one of the key struggles that we see playing out in foreign policy is this push and pull between realists who prioritize national interests and those who favor a more international approach. And so I'd be curious to get your perspective on where the world is in that struggle and how do challenges like climate change or this current pandemic affect that balance? And um, is this current moment different than what you've seen when you're looking historically? Well, I think that in the study of international relations, we've often exaggerated the difference between realism and liberalism and cosmopolitanism. And I try to discuss each of them in the book. Um, the realist says uh, there is no international government. It's the area of self-help. We have to put our own survival first or else we can't do anything. And um, uh, that's there's something in that you have to start with realism but you don't stop there my concern is that too many realists having made that analysis uh stop right after they start uh, so i argue start with realism but then there are certain values that you can add I mean, the, uh, cosmopolitanism says we are all human beings we do care if you see a a, 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 a syrian child drowning in the surf off of greece we do care if you have uh, a citizen of Honduras who is uh, uh, being molested at the border trying to get across the Rio Grande. I mean, as human beings, we're capable of concentric circles. And while we have an innermost circle of family or, or region or nationality, we do have an outer circle. And this view that uh, Steve Bannon and others put forward in 2016 that uh, you are either a cosmopolitan, a rootless cosmopolitan, or a loyal, nationalistic American. That's nonsense. In fact, most Americans are loyal Americans, but they also care what happens to others. And in that sense, you don't stop then with realism. You say, can I do a certain number of things to do good without doing unintended harm? Uh, which goes back to my attentions point. So cosmopolitanism plays a role. And then in the process of doing it, you have to think about the values of liberalism that the great liberal uh, philosopher John Rawls put forward, which is that you have to think about the, the rights and the institutions of other people. Uh, you don't violate them uh, uh, without good cause. And uh, in that sense, 
liberalism adds a concern for rights and institutions. And again, if you just pursue human rights, um, for example, you don't have a foreign policy. A foreign policy involves a trade-off of a variety of values that people want, including security and, and uh, a good standard of living and so forth. But they're also interested in human rights and they're also interested in alleviating humanitarian crises. So my argument in the book is each of these three views, realism, uh, cosmopolitan, and liberalism, brings something special to the dinner party. And you have to start, the main course is realism, but you don't stop there. You also add flavoring and other dishes from cosmopolitanism and liberalism. So in that sense, I think we, if you then apply that to the problems that we face in the 21st century, um, the question of, of climate change uh, is not a question that realists and cosmopolitans need to differ on. I mean, a realist, a good sensible realist will listen to the science and say, oh my God, we can lose uh, half of Florida or the Chesapeake Bay if, if we don't do something about this. Um, and similarly with the pandemics, um, we have to cooperate and get information and share information to be able to deal with a pandemic which doesn't respect borders. Um, so in that sense, you, you start with realism for both of these issues that uh, are such important ecological transnational issues. Where the cosmopolitanism might, and the liberalism might come in is on the pandemic, for example, do you vaccinate all of your own people before you care about anybody else? Or do you say, maybe um, I will reserve 20% of the vaccines developed in my country for health providers in poor countries that don't have adequate public health systems. And we would do that because it's humanitarian, but also in our national interest to do something like that. And if I do that, I then need institutions to make that work. When the institutions can include things like the World Health Organization, but also, um, uh, non-governmental institutions like Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccine and Immunization. So uh, a, a good a moral foreign policy for this 21st century uh, has to deal with these issues of climate change and, uh, and issues of, of uh, pandemics and so forth. Um, but it doesn't have to be phrased as either realism or cosmopolitanism or liberalism you're gonna need a dose of all three. But I say, generally, it makes sense to start with realism. Yes, it seems like too often we kind of fall into this either or thinking and, and really the, the answer is, is something uh, a bit in between. So, um, and just on the, on the point about vaccines, um, for those of you who are listening, we did a conversation maybe about a month ago on an impact fund for vaccines as a possible solution. So that's on our YouTube channel. Um, so I encourage you to check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, and actually speaking of the pandemic, now I'd like to switch a little bit to some of your work on soft power. Um, and you know, during the pandemic, many countries have been using their COVID-19 responses uh, to improve their international image. Um, one of the most obvious ones is China, which after a you know, a bad start, I think, at withholding information. They've really gone on to um, trying to provide extensive medical care and PPE to countries in need. Um, and similarly, soft power is very critical to U.S. diplomacy. Um, and yet our pandemic, our pandemic response has really resulted in a high number of infections and deaths. Um, and that really could impact the standing of the U.S. worldwide. So I'm curious to hear from you whether or not you see the responses to the pandemic as a kind of soft power and what the lasting impact will be on global dynamics. Well, I t it's a very interesting question about how long it's going to last and what way it's going to turn out. Uh, and I'll speculate on that in a minute. But let me say to start, I think both the U.S. and China, the largest and second largest economies in the world, uh, got off a very bad start. Uh, we started with both Xi Jinping and Donald Trump started with denial. And after denial, they turned to blame shifting. And uh, then, uh, uh, unfortunately, the United States uh, 
never got its act together and we keep getting inconsistent signals and we've had now the the highest uh, uh, rate of any of the of the large countries uh india is trying now to catch up with us on that unfortunately but the the uh in that sense, the Americans lost a great deal of soft power, uh, which grew out of our reputation for competence, uh, and not to mention humanitarian interests. Uh, China, I think, also lost a great deal of soft power. Uh, the fact that uh, by keeping, by using censorship and denial and keeping things quiet for at least six weeks or so from December until uh, the end of January, uh, they allowed this uh, uh, flu, this virus, to uh, uh, multiply in a way which uh, uh, made it much more difficult to control, and that still stands as as uh, as a black mark for their record. Uh, and so, trying to send people a lot of PPE, what I call face mask diplomacy, doesn't do the trick. I mean. Uh, if you look at attitudes toward China and Europe, they have they have not improved despite the uh, face mask diplomacy. In other words, you can't you can't just um, make a gesture or two or use propaganda and overcome incompetence. So both the U.S. and China have suffered um, in their uh, uh, their soft power as a result of the COVID episode. The question, though, you asked is, what do we see looking ahead? That's that's the interesting puzzle. Um, if uh, the U.S. is able to get its act together and really come to terms with uh, the, vi uh, the virus, uh, I think we can probably recover our soft power um, because a lot of American soft power grows not just out of government, but out of civil society. It comes from things like uh, universities and foundations like the Gates Foundation and Hollywood and so forth. Um, and those things are still there. So after, the, um, after this episode is over, um, I think the Americans may recover soft power the way they did uh, after the Vietnam era where the United States government policy was wildly unpopular, but within a decade, we had recovered our soft power. I think it's be harder for China to recover soft power because China has two problems. One is it has geographical conflicts with a lot of its neighbors. And it's very hard to look attractive in another country if you're taking some of their territory or contesting some of their territory. So, for example, uh, China may want to uh, exercise soft power in India, uh, might set up, set up some Confucius Institutes to uh, teach Chinese culture in India. But if, in the meantime, China is killing Indian borders on the uh, soldiers on the borders in the Himalayas, uh, that doesn't generate much attraction. And that goes for their relations with Vietnam, with Japan, and other countries as well. Uh, the other problem that China has for recovering its soft power is the problem of civil society. Um, increasingly, Xi Jinping is insisting on tight party control over everything. And that means that you can't unleash the, uh, the talents of your civil society. If you get a genius like Ai Weiwei and you lock him up or expel him, uh, that's not the way to increase your soft power. So I think unless China finds a way to ease up both on its wolf warrior diplomacy and uh, on its internal tight party control, I think it's gonna be harder for them to recover their soft power. Uh, now, if the US doesn't get its act together and continues to make a mess as we have done in the first uh, nine months of, uh, of the COVID epidemic, um, then it might be much harder for us to recover soft power as well. well that, but that's why I say we don't know the answer to your second question. We shall see. Um, we're going to turn it over to Q&A shortly. So if anyone has any questions, please do put it in the Q&A box. Um, I'd just like to follow up with, with one question before we do that. 
Um, and that's, we were just speaking about China and the US and, and you have some really interesting thoughts on that, on that dynamic because there's a lot of hand wringing, I think, you know, particularly in the US about the rise of China. Could you please just explain your view on the US-China dynamic and where you think that's headed? Well, I think uh, there has been a uh, worsening of US-China relations. Uh, I mean, I think it's now probably at its lowest point in about 40 years. Um, and uh, there is a lot of talk about a new Cold War. I think this type of uh, historical uh, analogy is misleading. Unlike the Cold War with the Soviet Union, uh, where we had almost no trade, we have massive trade with China. And uh, while with the Soviet Union, we had virtually uh, uh, no social contact, uh, here we have something like 370,000 Chinese students in American University. What's more, all our allies are uh, deeply interpenetrated in an international economy in which China is the second largest economy and in many cases, the leading trading partner. So to say that this is like the Cold War is to mistake um, uh, the differences. But it, there's also a problem that uh, uh, treating China as a Cold War and treating it as an ideological threat is a little bit of a reversal. In the Cold War, we were worried about uh, the idea that uh, communist ideology was a threat to Western democracy. Um, I don't think many people think that Xi Jinping thought is going to subvert uh, democracy in uh, Western countries. Uh, there may be other ways to try to subvert our political systems, but it's not because of the ideology uh, being attractive. Uh, in fact, what's interesting is that um, uh, Maoism uh, was much more attractive transnationally than, than Xi Jinping thought, even though it's supposedly enshrined with Chinese characteristics in the party constitution. Uh, so we pose more of an ideological threat to them. I mean, Xi Jinping has said all this Western universal values and talk about democracy is a real threat to us and you Chinese citizens can't talk about it. You can't even mention it. Uh, so if you say, where's the ideological threat? We're the bigger threat to them rather than vice versa. So these analogies that, uh, you know, we're in a new Cold War, uh, I think mislead us. We have a real competition with China, which is that China is manipulating uh, international economics uh, so that there's not a level playing field. They're trying to uh, coerce intellectual property uh, transfer uh, in, in many areas of technology. Um, and we should push back on that. It would be a mistake to let a company like Huawei, which is subservient to the Chinese uh, government and to the party, to uh, build 5G networks, which are gonna be central to uh, the Internet of Things in the United States. Well, it doesn't follow from that that we should cut all trade with China or cut back on Chinese uh, students coming here, many of whom stay and make major contributions to the United States. So somehow we've got to get in our mind that there is a new challenge from China. We're going to have to take it seriously. But to demonize the Chinese, to turn it into an ideological struggle, and to call it a new Cold War is not the right way to frame a strategy. A good strategy should neither underestimate nor overestimate the opponent. And it goes back to what I said about morality. You have to do due diligence. You have to have a contextual intelligence, understanding what the situation is. And when you develop a strategy which ignores or fails that test, you're gonna get it wrong and your consequences are likely to be immoral consequences. Thank you. I'm going to actually follow up on that with a question from the Q&A box. So this is from Joanna G. And so she asks, if you were part of a presidential administration, what would be your advice regarding US policy towards China? On the moral side, their harsh treatment of the Uyghur minority and oppression in Hong Kong provides a challenge when conducting relations. On the other hand, there are trade relations and other areas where both powers need to cooperate, such as with the pandemic and climate change. How does the US balance both sides of that equation? 
Well, I think that's exactly the right way to put it, which is that I've, I've said what we have with China is a cooperative rivalry. There are some places where we have a strong rivalry, and there are other places where we can't accomplish what we want to accomplish without cooperation with China. Uh, for example, global warming, we can't solve that alone. China can't solve it alone. And yet it's a real threat to both of us as well as to the rest of the world. And the same is true with pandemics. Um, we have to cooperate in areas like this. So the ecological interdependence, which obeys the laws of physics and biology, not politics, is going to continue and to increase. So as we develop a strategy toward China, we have to have a strategy which can push back on things like uh, coercive intellectual property transfer, push back on uh, expansion of Chinese claims in the South China Sea that go beyond the uh, rule of law in the sea, uh, push back on issues on human rights where we should express our values that what's happening in Xinjiang is not a, it is a violation of human rights, and at the same time be able to cooperate with them on climate or on uh, pandemics. And uh, instead of that, what we do is the Trump administration withdraws from the International uh, Paris Climate Accords and withdraws from the World Health Organization, totally counterproductive, leaving the field open to China, A, but B, failing to respond adequately to the, to the, uh, uh, to the larger transnational challenge. So as a strategy toward China has to have a, a balanced approach. You have to have a a understanding of there's going to be a rivalry and a need for cooperation simultaneously. Americans aren't always good at that. Okay, th thank you. And, and, and speaking of trying to balance, I'm going to stick to this um, question of China for a little bit. We have a question from uh, Putri Samudra, who is asking about um, your advice for Indonesia during the strategic rivalry that's happening between the US and China. Is it better for Indonesia to choose one of them? So this is a real good question about what should uh, smaller countries or less powerful countries do when they're faced between uh, two choices? Well, I, Indonesia should follow Indonesia's interests. And uh, if, if I remember the statistics correctly, um, I think uh, China is Indonesia's largest trading partner. So if the Americans said, cut off uh, your relations with China, that would be crazy and you shouldn't listen to them. On the other hand, if the Americans tell you something like, when Huawei offers you a real cheap deal on building 5G, you should know, uh, or you should at least ask yourself the question, do you want all your internal conversations reported immediately in Beijing? Do you want the ability of Beijing if there's a conflict between Indonesia and China regarding the South China Sea to suddenly find that part of your internet has gone out and so forth. So Indonesia ought to appraise its interests um, in terms of what's good for Indonesia. Uh, if the Americans ask you to do something uh, uh, irresponsible, like cut off all trade ties with China, ignore them. Uh, if the Americans suggest you, you want to look carefully at uh, whether your security is going to be greater or less if you have Huawei build your 5G networks, it might be worth listening. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a question from Anna Semenova who wants to know about what you think about um, morality in terms of Russian current policy. What, what comes to mind? So um, if you wanted to put some of uh, Putin's decisions in a larger context. Well, if you, it, it depends which types of decisions we're looking at. On the domestic decisions, um, questions like, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Novichok poisoning of an opposition leader, uh, that strikes me as a highly immoral action. Now, I don't know whether Putin did it or didn't do it, but apparently somebody did it. But, uh, but the, so there are some actions which, uh, which are, are immoral um, on their face of it. But I was thinking more of their international behavior. And there, it strikes me one of the things that Russia did uh, when it annexed uh, uh, Crimea from the Ukraine uh, and used uh, 
uh, if you want, uh, hybrid warfare techniques in eastern Ukraine, uh, uh, it broke one of the basic norms that have been pretty broadly agreed and accepted since 1945, which is that you didn't take your neighbor's territory by force. And uh, breaking that norm, of course, brought sanctions down upon Russia. And uh, my Russian friends say, oh, well, you know, but everybody does this. Well, in fact, no, everybody doesn't do it. People, sometimes my Russian friends will say, well, what about uh, uh, Serbia and, uh, uh, you know, the bombing of Serbia and so forth? And wasn't uh, the, wasn't Kosovo a case just like Crimea? Well, not really, because uh, the Americans or the, or the neighboring countries didn't take Kosovo. They, uh, uh, Kosovo declared independence. Um, that's a little bit different than uh, pretending that Crimea really declared independence uh, from Ukraine without the use of Russian force. So I think the fact that, that uh, Putin's uh, uh, tactics included um, violation of the, 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 a basic norm of the UN Charter, which had been pretty well observed since 1945, uh, would, would, is the reason why Russia is, is suffering sanctions and why I think most of the opinion polls show that Russian soft power is now um, not very high. It's high in the so-called near abroad where Russian culture uh, still has a strong influence in Russian language. But in Western Europe and in other parts of, of the world, uh, Russia is, is in fact uh, not doing very well in its soft power. Thank you. Um, I now have a question from Elena Ivanova, and she wants to know about whether the role of morals changes, and is it getting more important nowadays for the diplomacy of different countries, and are heads of states paying attention to that? Yes, I, the, the role of morals changes, and, and uh, I think you, could, you can see different cycles on it. It's not that it's entirely new in the post-45 period, but you do have in the uh, uh, in the UN Charter, in the UN Declar in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the establishment and development of international humanitarian law, so-called Geneva Conventions, uh, you do have a, an increased concern about moral issues. Um, some people argue that maybe it goes too far that uh, that the that there isn't enough realism in balancing out the consequences of some of this new moralism. Um, but I think it, it, is, uh, it is increased, let's say, from the 1930s, where the idea that you invaded your neighboring countries uh, tended to be accepted. You had a, a genocide. Uh, you had, in the wartime, the breakdown of international humanitarian law with the bombing of cities and civilians. Um, so it's not that the world today is totally moral or perfect, but it's probably more so uh, than the period before World War II. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from an anonymous attendee, but they're asking about the idea of American exceptionalism. Um, and whether or not that American moral exceptionalism is what the uh, questioner asks about, but but I think it, you know just this idea of American exceptionalism is 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 an important one, um, and how how does that play into the use of American soft power? Well, it, it, the United States American exceptionalism refers to the view that uh, uh, for a long time Americans have thought of themselves as exceptionally moral. Uh, after all, the Puritans who came uh, from England to uh, North America uh, were called Puritans because they thought they were worshiping God in a purer fashion. And so there's a, a long tradition of thinking of, uh, of themselves as more, uh, or ourselves as more moral. But it, it, in fact, um, very often we didn't live up to, to our, uh, our claims. But our self-image was exceptional moralism, but, uh, you know, if, if a country that takes half of its neighbor uh, territory in the 19th century, as we did to Mexico, or a country which uh, puts down a revolution in the Philippines and 
1902 using waterboarding and torture, uh, that's not particularly moral. So we have a gap between our, our self-image and uh, our practice. On the other hand, the, the benefit is the Americans uh, are a self-critical society with protests and demonstrations and so forth. Uh, we're able to change some of these moral issues. Uh, uh, the civil rights protests in the 1960s were an example. The anti-Vietnam War protests were an example. Uh, and we're seeing some of that now with the uh, responses to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So the fact that the United States is a society which doesn't live up to its high moral self-esteem, but nonetheless does continually have periods when it strives to, uh, uh, does give something to the idea of American exceptionalism. It doesn't mean we're exceptionally moral. It means we keep trying in the way that then we fail. Um, I think in that sense, the, the, uh, the issue of, of how we'll look in the future um, is, is going to be um, uh, largely determined by some of the struggles that are going on now. Um, and uh, frankly, we don't know the outcome of that. Um, some of this will be determined by the elections in November, uh, but um, there are also larger social movements going on that um, uh, we'll have to see how they turn out. But so American exceptionalism is there, doesn't mean we're exceptionally moral, it means we're exceptional and that we keep striving. I think that that's a very good point. I, I worked briefly in the State Department as a uh, public affairs officer in public diplomacy. And, and I think that that was whenever we were faced with challenges of how to explain the US narrative, I think that 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 piece is key is that, you know, we're, we try sometimes to reckon with it. And so I think that the reckoning is the important bit. Um, I'm going to pick up on a thread of what, what you had mentioned uh, toward the end of the last question for the next question from uh, Ted Molina, which is, uh, does President Trump's foreign policy mark a break with post-war US foreign policy from a morality perspective, or does he fit into the same broader paradigm as presidents like Obama and Bush? Well, I, I, I uh, tried to give a report card for each of the 14 presidents in my book. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that President Trump um, comes out in the bottom quartile. Uh, he's, he, and he's even more distinct. He seems to be more amoral. People will criticize, for example, Richard Nixon uh, for a number of the actions that he took um, uh, and uh, as a highly immoral president. But Nixon was calculatingly immoral president. He did a few particular good things, a few particularly bad things, and he, he lied and he calculated around those bad things. Um, with President Trump, we sometimes wonder whether he considers the moral issues at all. And when he comes to express himself, he seems to have very little concern about um, the importance of truth. Um, you know, the saying goes, all politicians lie. Frankly, it should be all human beings lie. Anybody who's a little bit honest with themselves will have to admit that. But uh, it makes a difference how often you lie and for what purposes. So all the presidents in my book, um, I can show places where they lied. But uh, according to the Washington Post um, uh, fact-checking department, uh, President Trump has told something like 20,000 lies in the first three and a half years of his office. That's unprecedented. Um, and when you lie that extent, uh, you are different from all other presidents. And what you're doing essentially is debasing the currency of trust. Uh, when, when, when you lie that frequently, who's gonna believe you for anything? And when you debase the currency of trust, it makes it much harder to uh, have successful diplomacy. Why are people gonna believe you? And it also damages your soft power. So yes, in that sense, President, uh, uh, Trump does stand out from the other presidents. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question is from Yashita Gupta, and they want to know whether you see, um, what, whether you think that big nations are losing their soft power and are other nations making their mark within in the international field within the realm of soft power? 
Well, I, small nations can have soft power uh, as well as big nations, and all nations can have ups and downs in their in their soft power. I'm always struck by Norway, which is a population of only about five million people, but by having a uh, a just domestic society, by giving one percent of its GDP for overseas assistance, by taking the lead in a number of uh, peace initiatives and so forth, Norway uh, punches well above its weight in terms of, of, of its soft power. Um, Canada used to uh, place a great deal of emphasis on its soft power. Um, the, uh, uh, some people say it went down after you switched from Lloyd Axworthy, uh, who emphasized this under the liberals to to the Harper administration, which was more narrow and self-interested. You have fewer Canadians operating in peacekeeping operations and so forth. So that's a, a medium-sized country who's, who was higher in its soft power ranking than, uh, let's say, it became later. Um, U.S. soft power has gone up and down um, as, as a large country. It's, uh, uh, it, it's fascinating to me that um, uh, if, when, after the invasion of Iraq, American soft power declined quite dramatically as measured in uh, public opinion polls. And yet after we elected the first African-American president, Barack Obama, uh, you saw a considerable increase in the soft power of the United States. And we'll have to see what happens to American soft power after um, uh, the Trump administration. Right now, as I said earlier, the incompetence of the American behavior uh, coupled with the attitude of, uh, of uh, you know, America first um, has diminished American soft power. And we'll have to see whether this recovers or not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Nikita Kozemyankin, who wants to know, um, he mentions that you published an article about Japan more important than ever in October 2018. And do you still consider rebalancing the Japan-US relationship as a key turning point for the Asia Pacific region? Yes, I think the US-Japan security relationship is, is crucial to shaping the environment uh, in East Asia. Uh, I think back to the Clinton administration when we were looking at the rise of China and we realized that um, you had three major powers in East Asia, uh, US, Japan, and China. And going back to sort of balance of power 101, uh, it's better to be part of the two than the one. And so at that point, we basically let's said, let's reaffirm the US-Japan Security Treaty and that will provide incentives for China to uh, uh, be less of a bully or to be, to be more uh, accommodating as its power grows. Um, and it, many people uh, believe that that uh, still remains the case, that uh, uh, the US and, and Japan uh, do present a, a, a way of shaping the environment. Others say, well, and they have to work with Australia and India and the so-called quad to shape the environment for, for China's growth. But I do think that uh, the heart of it is the US-Japan alliance. People who worry that China will try to push uh, the United States outside the so-called first island chain, uh, forget that the first island chain consists in large part of Japan where there are 50,000 American troops that the Japanese want uh, us to keep there and pay a good portion of the host nation support for having them there. So I'd say this alliance has worked. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question, we're getting close to time, but I think we have time for a few more, is from uh, Alexei Nikitin, who wants to, who's questioning, um, so speaking about moral policies, so when President o did, did President Obama do the right thing um, with his operation in Libya in 2011 and when he didn't do this in Syria in 2013? So could you basically try to evaluate those two different decisions within uh, light of morality? 
Well, I think in the, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And then, uh, I think Obama himself has uh, had second thoughts about it as he's expressed in some interviews after, uh, after his presidency. In, in the case of Libya, he started out right. He, he got a resolution from the UN Security Council in support from the Arab League and uh, aimed at trying to protect the citizens of Benghazi. But what it was missing was follow-up uh, as the, uh, if there should have been a, a major program for peacekeeping troops uh, multilaterally to have um, uh, provided a structure for uh, stability after uh, Gaddafi was formed. And in that, if that didn't happen, and Libya today is still racked by civil war. Um, this experience, so in that sense, it, the, the, the intentions and the early means were good, but they weren't complete or weren't sufficient to ensure good consequences. I think that in turn had a strong effect on uh, the, uh, the Syrian example. It, it, it was impossible because of the Libyan case uh, to get the Russians and the Chinese to support a UN Security Council resolution uh, for Syria. And that meant any intervention was going to have to be uh, unilateral or uh, just a few countries rather than with the UN imprimatur. And Obama felt that uh, the problem with it was that uh, Yes, you could go in, but how would you get out? And were you really going to do more good than harm? And um, so in that sense, uh, there was an interaction between uh, the experience in uh, Libya and the, uh, the absence of intervention in Syria. And I, Obama expressed this, in, as I mentioned, in his interviews with the uh, the Atlantic uh, magazine uh, just as he was leaving office. Thank you. Yes, I remember that was, that was a very good interview. Um, so our next question is from Victoria Cherkaska and she, uh, uh, she's asking about um, what well, terms of religion in particular. So religiously conservative countries where I think that's probably, I think the question is probably where that's a founding principle. Um, do they use morals in their international politics or how does that come into play? Yes, and we have to realize that, uh, that different countries have different religious and cultural traditions. And so you'll have different interpretations of morality. Um, and in that sense, uh, while there is a uh, psychologists and anthropologists have shown that there is a moral impulse in almost all human beings. It, it gets expressed in very different ways in different cultures and different religious traditions. And uh, so people say, well, if there's no universal morality, uh, how can you have any hope internationally? And that goes back to something I mentioned earlier, that if you try to apply moral principles to all aspects of human life, uh, it's not going to work. On the other hand, if you say, are there certain basics which are already enco encoded in the uh, uh, international humanitarian law, like you don't kill civilians on purpose in war, um, that's pretty universal across religions and cultures. And similarly, many of the aspects of the Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights have a pretty widespread standing. On the other hand, if you try to uh, to try to uh, say that there should be no laws against blasphemy or or the gender relations should be treated the same in all countries, uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, agreement on that. Uh, so, in between the fact that uh, there isn't universal agreement on everything, and the fact that there is some close to universal agreement on some basic things. Uh, that's where the space for morality lies. So it really seems to often be about finding that space between these, these two polarities. Um, 
I think um, I think we'll be heading into uh, probably our last question, but uh, this is actually from an anonymous attendee. But they want to know how the development of internet and information technology has affected morality, particularly within the foreign affairs realm. Well, it's a very intriguing question, and we still don't know the full answer because there's uh, we're in an evolving situation. But it certainly has meant that um, everybody is their own editor. Uh, everybody can get news on things which previously uh, were restricted before. And it's very easy to whip up a, uh, a moral reaction by using outrage on the internet and the algorithms that companies like Google and Facebook use benefit from uh, more outrageous things. The more outrageous it is, the more eyeballs, the more eyeballs, the more under advertising. And so you do have um, uh, greater capacity for outrage, also greater capacity for manipulation uh, through conspiracy theories and a harder job of editing them. So I, I think you see an increase in moralism as a result of the technology I don't know whether we've really seen an increase in morality in terms of uh, looking at actions which have all three of the uh, uh, dimensions that I mentioned, good intentions, uh, good means, and, uh, and good consequences. But uh, stay tuned, because they're going to be around for a while. So in, in terms of staying tuned, um, do you have any final thoughts for us um, as we head into the hour? Basically, you know, I think this has been a rather remarkable year um, in terms of obviously the pandemic, but also, you know, socially within the United States and we have an election coming up. Um, you know, what, what what's on your mind and, and what are you looking at as, uh, as we head toward the close of 2020? Well, I, I think uh, it's, it's sometimes easy to become depressed by all the problems. I mean, um, imagine, uh, these kids trying to go to school, imagine the, I, my granddaughters going to college and finding that uh, they can't attend classes. I mean, this is rough. Um, it makes me, you know, I sometimes joke that launching a book uh, in 2020 was, was my great misfortune. But if I compare that to what's happened to these younger people and their disappointments, it's trivial. Um, and it's easy to become depressed. And also it's, also, it's unlikely that we're gonna be through this COVID episode until sometime next year, if then. Uh, and so that sense of uh, trying to keep a long-term perspective and to avoid being depressed, to realize that uh, we've been through worse things in the past. Uh, the great influenza uh, of 1918 actually killed many more people than World War I as well as many more people than COVID. Um, and it's, or if you look at the Great Depression of uh, uh, when Roosevelt came to power in 1932 and uh, the threats to democracy as well as having one out of five people uh, unemployed. Um, we've been through worse. Uh, this is a rough year. I suspect we'll get through it again, but don't ask me to tell you all the answers to how. I, I appreciate the fact that, that you don't make predictions, so it's, uh, I think it's a sign of wisdom. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Nye, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time, and thank you to everyone who joined. It looks like we had a, a good contingent from Russia, among, among other places, and so I you know, thank you everyone for listening. I apologize if we couldn't get to your questions. Um, just as a note, we uh, we do have an upcoming briefing on October 20 or September 29th. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. From 8 to 9 p.m. or 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time with Kishore Mabubani. Uh, so it should be interesting. I've, I've um, uh, interesting to to follow with you, Dr. Nye, um, as he'll talk about uh, U.S.-China relations. So uh, please um, please do join that, everyone, and. Um, and I do encourage you to you know, follow us on social media if you can, YouTube, um, Twitter, and, uh, and for those of you who can, you know, we are a nonprofit. We're trying to keep these briefings uh, free and open to all around the world. So if you have the ability, you know, we, any donation would be very much appreciated. So 
Um, with that, Dr. Nye, thank you very much. It has been a real pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you, Courtney. I enjoyed it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>